seagulls whooped and wheeled in the sky over the bobbing wreckage as Detective Constable Daniels made his way toward a brooding figure on the shore. The apex scavengers were hungrily searching for tasty tidbits, scraps of flesh, a finger, maybe even a succulent eyeball. Having something fresh on the menu had driven them into a frenzy. They just had to hope that the crabs didn't beat them to it. Reaching his destination, Daniels took out his notebook and flipped to his current page. What do you reckon, Sarge? Chalk this one up to an act of God? Detective Sergeant Finch looked pensively out to sea. The Coast Guard was still checking for survivors. Combing the area around the blasted crag to the north of Bettles Cove. So far, all they had found were corpses. Or parts of corpses. <sighs> I ain't so sure, lad. Finch sniffed and directed the young constable's attention to a body on the waterline, being gently lapped by the morning tide. <coughs> DC Daniels gagged. Christ on a bike! My thoughts exactly. The body lay face up and had a six-inch bait knife sticking out of the left eye socket. Whatever happened to this poor soul, it sure is buggery wasn't an act of God. Almost as if to highlight his point, a police diver surfaced not far from the shore clutching a severed arm, holding a flare gun. Daniels nearly lost his breakfast. Turning the delicate youth away from the awful scene of carnage, Finch seemed it prudent to keep his protege's mind on the job. So, what you managed to find out from our fishermen's friends? Uh, not much that we didn't already know from the harbor master. The sea here went out last night at low tide. To collect the lobster pots as usual, same crew as always, everything seemed normal. Ah, uh, bugger. Finch exhaled, his breath visible in the November air. So what we've got is a veteran fishing crew going out on a perfectly calm night to collect some lobster pots, and ending up torn to shreds. Any word on the survivor? Yes, Guff. He's conscious and stable. Few bumps and bruises and a heck of a chill, but he'll live. He's over at A&E being checked out. Good. Then maybe he'll be able to shed some light on what the hell happened here. Come on, let's leave Soko to it. There's nothing else we can do here. Finch took one last look at the body on the beach. We'll head back to the station, liaise with the guff. Then go and see if our survivor is missing a bait knife. Don't excite him. The nurse's words reverberated in Finch's head as he pushed open the door to treatment room 3A. Wasn't so much a request as a threat. Apparently, it had taken them the best part of the ten hours he'd been in the ward to stop the survivor of the sea hare wreck from screaming. Finch had assured her that he just wanted to ask a few preliminary questions. He would follow up as and when after he'd been released. Steve Michaels was in a right old state. His ribs were taped up, his nose flattened, and his right arm bandaged from fingertip to elbow. He was evidently high as a kite on some hardcore painkillers. He didn't realize he had guests until Daniels dragged a metal-legged chair across the floor. He sat up with a jolt, his panicked eyes scanning the room. Morning, Steve, Finch began desperately trying to appear friendly as he struggled to fit his bulky frame into the chair next to the bed. I just need to ask you a few questions about what happened last night. Um, okay. Steve seemed fidgety and distracted. I don't know what to tell you. How about the truth? You'll never believe the truth. Steve trailed off, not looking Finch in the eye. Finch sat forward. Look... I'll level with you here. You're the lone survivor of a fishing accident where one of the deceased washed up on the beach with a knife stuck in his eye. What? Steve yelped in confusion. No, it couldn't. How? I... Finch let the silence hang heavy for a moment before continuing his line of questioning. Your knife, I take it. The fact that it had your initials engraved on the handle did kind of point me in your direction. It was old Tommy Granger, 
You stabbed him, didn't you? No, I mean, yes. I mean, I didn't stab him. Daniel snorted. Talk sense, damn it. Did you stab him or not? Finch motioned for his partner to back off with a discreet hand gesture. Come now, Steve. Just tell us what happened. Doesn't seem like I have much choice. No, you really don't. Steve exhaled like a ruptured balloon. <sighs> Fine. It started not long after we left the harbor. Sixteen hours earlier. Steve rubbed his hands together, then shoved them into his pockets to keep out the bitter chill. The sea hare bobbed gently in the water as Frank Porter brought it around towards the first lobster pot. Frank was an expert seaman and stopped the rickety old fishing vessel to a halt next to the pot's yellow marker buoy. Steve stood and watched it for a second, entranced by its motion in the moonlight. Did you stand there like a spare prick at a brothel? Hold the ruddy thing aboard! Frank snarled as he nimbly descended the wooden ladder from the raised helm. Where the hell are the others? Um... Steve fidgeted. I think Larry's below deck and Tommy's over there. He jabbed a finger down to where a grizzled old man in filthy oilskins and a sou'western was gazing up at the sky. Aye, Jonah! Frank bellowed. Quit stargazing! Get your arse over here! Tommy didn't react. He was too engrossed in what he was doing. Didn't help that Frank had addressed him by his hated nickname, Jonah. Frank muttered some obscenities under his breath. Jesus fuck, yeah. Go find Larry, he instructed Steve. I'll go and slap some sense into the ancient mariner. Steve nodded, turned towards the step down to the cramped lower deck. As he reached out his hand to open the door, it swung open, and a lumbering figure of Larry appeared. What the hell are you playing at? Frank's doing his nut. Larry sniffed. <sighs> well, he can go whistle. I was in the head. Come on, help me with this pot, will ya? Larry followed Steve onto the deck, still buckling up his belt. Taking the long metal hook from by the ladder, Steve snagged the buoy, pulled it onto the deck. Larry took hold of the rope and started to heave. Together, they pulled the first pot on board. While they fought to bring their potential catch up from the depths, Steve couldn't help listening to Frank and Tommy's conversation. What the hell's matter with ya? Frank growled, shaking Tommy by his stooped shoulders. You been on the whiskey again? Ah. Tommy drawled, slapping the younger man's hands away. I just noticed something, that's all. Well, notice something on your own bloody time. I ain't paying you to stare into space like some drotted moon calf. We shouldn't be out here tonight. Tommy's voice was low and full of foreboding. We should head back now. What are you blathering about, you old fool? More fishermen's tails. <sighs> Frank snorted derisively. Tommy was well known in the area as a font of old superstitions. It was one of the reasons he was called Jonah. That and the fact that he'd sunk more times than one of Frank's lobster pots. Look, the bullseye. Tommy pointed up at the brightest star in the sky. It's just like it was last time. What last time? When the sea bounty went down. Tommy pulled down his collar and scratched the tattoo on his neck. Cobblers. That ain't nothing to do with the stars and you know it. Davy was as pissed as Long John Silver's parrot and hit a rock. So they say. Tommy shrugged still absently-mindedly rubbing the black spot on his skin. Ah, that's right. You can't remember what happened, can you? All been on the sauce, hadn't ya? Tommy shrugged again but remained silent. Enough of this cod swallop, Frank asserted. Get your bony arse over there. Help Laurel and Hardy with the catch. Resisting the urge to physically drag his crewmen down the deck, Frank stormed off and headed below. Tommy didn't move. He simply returned his gaze to the heavens. It's the Alderborn Convergence. I saw it on the BBC News website. Steve muttered to Larry as he tossed the scrawny-looking langoustine over the side. Eh? Larry's brow creased in confusion. 
It's when the Aldebaran stars line up with our moon and sun. It only lasts about 40 hours every 15 years or so. It's pretty rare. Larry looked at Steve like he'd just beamed down from one of the celestial bodies he'd mentioned. Never mind. Steve untangled a large brown crab from the pot, dropped it into the keep bucket. What's all this about Tommy sinking? Larry chuckled under his breath. Oh, I. Tommy's the most unlucky sailor I know. He's capsized his little rowboat more times than anyone can remember. Frank mentioned a proper shipwreck, though. Larry's face darkened. Yeah, bad business, that. Small dredger went down with all hands. Except old Jonah, that is. Coast Guard found him clinging to a plastic barrel like a limpet the following morning. Jesus. As Steve scooped up the last of the small crustaceans and detritus up in his hands and tossed them over the side, Frank reappeared, slamming the door behind him. Right! On to the next one. Frank glared down the deck at Tommy and shook his head. Silly old sod. Muttering oaths, he climbed the ladder and switched on the engine. Before the sea hare could move, Tommy started to scream. Steve nearly jumped out of his skin as a sexagenarian started to thrash around, clutching his neck. Tommy! What the hell? Before Steve could utter another syllable, there was an almighty splash as Tommy went headfirst off the end of the boat. Man overboard! Man overboard! Larry bellowed, racing down the deck. Steve dithered before grabbing a life preserver off the wall and following. What the bloody hell's going on down there? Frank shouted as he killed the engine. It's Tommy! He's had some kind of a fit and fallen overboard. Damn it! Frank grumbled, more concerned with hitting his quota than a fisherman prone to taking a swim. Right, I'm coming. Can you see him? No, it's too dark. Larry replied, leaning over the side, calling Tommy's name. Fetch light. Steve paused in his jog to snatch up one of the electric lamps from the deck, fumbling with it for a second. He finally turned it on. His mouth fell open, and a wail of terror escaped. Something was rising from the water next to Larry. It was long and covered in suckers. It was a colossal tentacle. Larry! Look out! Frank cried, reaching Steve's spot. It was too late. The tentacle coiled around Larry's neck, cutting off a scream. The barbs in the suckers tore at his skin as it wound itself around and around. Larry's arms flapped, and his fingers tried to release the pressure. All to no avail. Before anyone could help, the tentacle drew back with such force that Larry's head popped off like the top of a ketchup bottle as blood gushed over the stern, turning the white paint red. Frank grabbed a large hook, thrashed at the tentacle. He landed a single blow, and it gracefully slid under the surface of the water, barely causing a ripple. What the fuck was that? Steve babbled. Frank wasn't listening. He calmly took Larry's body by the belt and pitched it over the side. It landed in the water, turning the foam pink. Steve roared and bawled his fists, charging towards Frank. You bastard! You can't just tip him! Frank pressed his finger to Steve's lips as the boat listed sideways, something heavy drawing alongside. Speaking in a whisper, he told Steve, Keep your bloody voice down. With any luck, it'll eat Larry and Tommy and forget about us. Steve went to argue the morality of Frank's suggestion, but quickly thought better of it. Okay. What the fuck is it, Frank? Search me. Colossal squid, perhaps. Motioning for Steve to keep quiet, he started down the deck. Come on. Get below. You'll try and get us out of here. Steve followed trying desperately to be quiet as his heavy boots clomped on the wooden surface. Reaching the door, Frank clapped him on the shoulder. Call the Coast Guard. I'll shine a light in the water, see if it's safe to move. Steve nodded, stumbled down the stairs. There was one large room used for holding the catch, a bunk room, and the head. He moved to the far corner and turned on the radio. 
let out a deafening belch of static. Steve stupidly told the device as he frantically twiddled knobs to silence the din. Finally, he found the right frequency, and the noise abated. Before Steve could speak into the microphone, banging from above followed by a cry of, Look out! drew his attention to the porthole above the radio. The tentacle burst of the window, smashing the radio and sending Steve flying. He collided with the desk, knocking various fishing paraphernalia to the floor. The slippery appendage thrashed around, feeling its way around the cabin, feeling for Steve. As he scrabbled back on his haunches, another tentacle, followed by a third, they swept in through the side of the boat tearing a sizable hole in the hull just above the waterline. Wood splintered under the immense strength of the creature. Holy shit! Steve babbled and gibbered in utter bewilderment. His two hands gripped the wood, and the beast tried to force itself inside. It has fingers! The fucking squid has fingers! The monster's beak snapped and clicked hungrily as two more tentacles slipped inside. Hold on, lad! Frank called from above as he gunned the engine. The sea hare swung violently to starboard, sending Steve flying backwards towards Frank's cabin. The squid monster tried to hold on, but the sharpness of the turn sent it tumbling off into the waves. Steve panted, tried to right himself as water sloshed of the damage in the hull. Thinking fast, he took a life jacket and slipped it on, taking another for Frank. Scrambling out of the lower deck, he shut and locked the door to aid the hull's integrity. Frank, I've got you a life jacket. It's our lad. Grab the flare gun on your way up. Steve did as instructed and started to climb the ladder. Can we make it to harbor? I bloody well hope so. I don't fancy taking a swim with that thing. Steve got up to the helm and passed Frank the life jacket. Ta. He slipped it on and fastened it up before bringing the sea here about near the blasted crag. I think we're all right now. We'll come this far in then. Steve breathed a sigh of relief, then looked into the water ahead of the boat. Frank, look out! A dark shape was hurtling towards the sea here like a torpedo. It broke the water just before collision and hurtled towards the helm. Its slick crimson body was around two meters in length with tentacles just as long. Worse still, it had four limbs, two powerful hind legs, and a pair of elongated arms lined with suckers the size of saucers. The abomination landed on the sloped prow of the boat on all fours and started to scramble towards the window. Steve ducked and fell sideways from the helm as a tentacle lashed through the window, showering Frank in glass. The grizzled fisherman growled and pointed the flare gun at the creature. Before he could pull the trigger, a supple limb snapped around his wrist, yanked his arm clean away from his body. Blood splattered the helm as Frank fell into it, jerking the boat off course. Steve slid across the deck as the sea hare pitched violently towards the crack. He landed hard on his side, driving the air from his lungs and cracking a couple of ribs. As the ship rocked, Frank lost his footing and tumbled from the helm landing on his head with a sickening crunch. His left foot kicked, overturning the bucket of crabs, which made a beeline for the mush oozing from the gaping split in his skull. Crying, Steve could only watch as the squid monster climbed through the smashed window and prepared to pounce. In a last-ditch effort to save his life, he slid his bait knife from his pocket and locked the blade. The monster sprung into the air, landed on top of Steve, smashing him across the nose with one of its forelimbs. Ah! With its prey dazed, the creature parted its tentacles to expose its hideous beak and went to bite into Steve's neck. With all his strength, he reared back and slammed the knife into the creature's oily black eye. As hard and as deep as he could, it screamed and thrashed as the knife pierced its brain. As it fell backward away from Steve, it spewed a thick stream of ink over his arm. Steve bellowed in agony, 
The ink burned like acid. Fearing another attack, he gripped the knife in his other hand and prepared to strike. To his relief, however, the creature staggered on its hind legs, then pitched overboard. Got you, you fucker! Steve started to laugh hysterically. <laughs> Seconds after, there was a tremendous crash as the sea here ran aground on the rocks and everything went black. Eighteen hours later. Night had fallen by the time Steve Michaels had finished telling Finch and Daniels his fantastic story. Despite it being November, Finch had been forced to open a window to let some fresh air into the room. Steve's narrative, coupled with the smell of bleach and surgical spirit, was making him feel light at it. <laughs> Bollocks! DC Daniels roared with laughter. Daniels! Knock it off! Finch snapped. Oh, come on, Sarge. You don't believe this rubbish, do you? It ain't rubbish. It's the bloody truth. Jonah turned into a squid. Steve was agitated, rubbing at his injured arm. At this, Daniels roared again. That's the best defense I've ever heard. It wasn't me. It was a squid. <laughs> How did he turn into a squid then, smartass? You don't expect us to believe that it was to do with this moon thing. The Aldebaran Convergence, Finch added flatly, his mind elsewhere. He had seen soccer marks on what was left of Larry's corpse when it had been fished from the sea. That and some of the bizarre things he'd dealt with over the years in Bettle's Cove told him to not dismiss the story out of hand. Daniels, in contrast, was new to the area. He was fresh from London, thought he knew it all. So the moon did it. What was he then, a, a were squid? Shut it, Daniels! I won't tell you again! Finch barked, his voice booming off the white walls. This time, Daniels obeyed. Riling D.S. Finch was something he'd been warned not to do under any circumstances. The hulking veteran was well known for his fiery temper, especially towards members of the press. Finch glowered at Daniels for a couple of seconds, before turning back to the patient. <sighs> Steve, are you okay? Steve was pulling at the bandage on his right arm. I don't know. I feel a bit... Something's wrong with my arm. Do you need a nurse? Finch asked, extracting himself from the chair. No, I... Steve's eyes were glassy as he yanked at the bandage, started to unwind it. I don't think you should be doing that. Finch stated in a firm voice as he smoothed his walrus mustache. Daniels, fetch the nurse. I don't understand. Steve slurred, stopping Daniels in his tracks. My skin, it's healed. It looked like fried bacon earlier. Daniels snorted. <laughs> <laughs> don't be ridiculous. He changed direction and moved in for a closer look. See? Steve finished removing the bandages and held his limb out for Daniels to see. As he turned his arm over, he gasped. There was a circular mark on his wrist that looked like a tattoo. Oh, God! No! What is it? What's wrong? Finch asked, leaning in. Hold it up, let me see. It was a perfectly circular ring, with a smaller disc in the center. A bullseye. <laughs> It's exactly the same as the one Jonah had on his neck. Steve started to shake and hyperventilate. Oh, God! The moon! His eyes had darted to the window. The moon was full and high. The Aldebaran convergence was still in place. Shit! Help me hold him down! Finch cried as Steve started to violently convulse. His eyes had rolled back in his head, and he was frothing at the maw. Daniels did as instructed. Grab the panic button! Finch asserted. The what? The little dongle thing with the picture of a nurse on the big red button. It should be hanging down your side of the bed. As Daniel started to rummage amongst the myriad tubes and cables sticking out of the wall, Steve suddenly sat, bolt upright, his eyes turning as black as oil. Finch let go and instinctively backed away. I... I... 
Steve's mouth worked up and down, slack and drooling. I hear your honorable Kvila Rleinovgarten. Got it! Daniels beamed, standing upright and pressing the panic button. Steve's mouth opened, wider than it should be possible, as he started to retch. On the final heave, eight rubbery tentacles burst from his mouth, covered in saliva. Daniels yelped and was sent spinning as one of the sprouting arms slapped him across the cheek. Finch grabbed the wooden chair as Steve's body turned inside out. His skin split along the back before reforming the wrong way around as the glistening crimson hide of a were squid. It started to raise on its hind legs, the bed rattling like crazy. Daniels, dazed and confused, scrambled to his feet, kicked the end of the bed as hard as he could. It rolled on its wheels and slammed into the wall. The unsteady creature lost its balance for long enough for Finch to belt it as hard as he could with the wooden chair. It splintered upon impact and felled the beast, which shot a jet of ink that splattered the ceiling above the open window. Quick! The sheet! Wrap it in the sheet! Daniels did as Finch instructed, then helped the superior shove the writhing bundle out of the window. It flopped and flailed as it plummeted three stories to the ground, landing with a disgusting splat. Finch and Daniels, panting for breath, looked down at the creature. It was no longer a creature. It was once again Steve, his body broken and lifeless. What the hell do we do now, Sarge? Leave it to me. Steve attacked you and then jumped. Simple. Finch stood and examined the ink. Have you ever signed the official secrets act before? Um, no. Ah. <sighs> Finch sighed. Well... You're gonna have to get used to it in this town. With that, he left to intercept the nurse, leaving Daniels gazing down at Steve's corpse. He was so engrossed that he didn't feel the pinprick of ink as it fell from the ceiling onto the back of his neck.